Please welcome to the stage Jim Wolfston, President of College Now. Well, thank you very much. It's great to have the opportunity to speak to you again. And uh, I, I want to say that it's uh, wonderful, of course, to start the morning with a little bit of applause. So thanks for that. And I also want to reflect that appreciation back to you because we have probably tens of thousands of university users. We, if you add in this, the students who apply to college, who look for scholarships, who generally interact with our systems, that goes into the millions. This group is the distilled group. This is the 500 or so people who are the most engaged with our products. You are the tightest, most important piece of the college net innovation puzzle. Now, I've talked about this in the past, and I'll be talking about it more this morning. I call this the circle of innovation. It's an analog to evolution in the sense that there is this variation part that college net's responsible for where we come up with variations, new features of existing products, or entirely new tangents, such as, for example, the work we're doing in access, mobility, and opportunity for our country. So I want to talk a little bit more about the circle of innovation. I want to define further why CollegeNet does some of the things that it does with respect to hatching these variations. But I also want to talk, importantly, about your role, your role in selection. It's exceptionally powerful. Just as in the natural world, the natural world makes a decision as to whether an organism is fit or not. You make decisions as to whether the variations that we hatch are appropriate. You say yes or no. That's an exceptionally powerful position. And this group, this activist group, is so important in that process because we're going to be talking here about new features. I'm going to be sharing ideas with you that I don't share generally with the rest of our user community or the, or the broader community, or the broader public. So thank you very much for being part of this circle of innovation. Now, I think it's a wonderful place to be in. Because if you think about the way the world works, the way the future works, uh, it's, it's changing faster and faster and faster. And that's happening at the hand of human beings. People are creating new processes, new technologies. And there's really three types of people. There's probably 99.99999% of the, the worst or Earth's population that has no seat at the table. They have no opportunity to shape the future. It's not because they're not motivated. It's not because they're not capable. It's not because they're apathetic. It's just they don't have the opportunity that you and I have to work together to innovate the future. And then there's another very small sliver, thankfully, of people who just simply want to destroy or take, whether it's the Wall Street bankers who aggrandize for themselves or the, the Washington politicians who spend half their time trying to raise money and the other half in, in some kind of meretricious pose, taking it from their donors. Or it's the kleptocrats who run countries like Ukraine, just taking, taking, taking for themselves. We're different. We're in that rarefied slice that actually has an opportunity to do good. And we have a great opportunity, particularly with respect to this problem of, of social and economic mobility. And so we're going to talk about these two things. We're going to talk about the circle of innovation, it, dive into it a little more deeply, we're going to talk about how we can apply it, and are applying it, successfully already to enhance social and economic mobility in the United States. And we also have a great opportunity because of the fact that higher education, here we are at the epicenter, higher education is the most important rung in the ladder for economic and social mobility in our, in our world. <laughs> so let me talk a little bit about the problem of mobility itself. So we understand that this is real. Now, it's a political issue. The Republicans are talking about it. Marco Rubio is talking about uh, the problems with uh, economic inequality and our, our, the, the role of education in this. Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders, even uh, um, Janet Yellen, the director or the chairman of the Federal Reserve, is talking about this problem. So it's a real problem. The politicians are catching up to this problem, thankfully. We're going to get a debate about this, which is wonderful. Because here's some of the issues. For the first time in the United States history, we have a retiring generation that's being replaced by a generation that's less educated. And that's a real problem in a, in a, in a competitive global economy. How are we going to compete if our populace becomes less educated over time? It goes to the maxim that Thomas Jefferson laid out for us. He said, look, he said, there's been no, nothing in history of where a democracy has succeeded without, without a well-educated population. 
So the corollary to that is that the less education our country gets, the less effective our democracy will be. So education plays such a critical role in this. Another fact, and I won't say all the facts around this, this is a very big topic, but those that are germane to education include the fact that the United States has dropped from number three in college graduation rate to number 13 among developed nations. That's not good, again, in a global competitive economy. We've got to do better than that. Now, from our data, is this rather odd statistic? Now, think about this. If we average out all the student populations that you represent here at your campuses, 77% of those students come from families who are above the national median income. Now, wait a minute. Evolution didn't somehow say, when it was doling out phenotypes, it didn't say, look, the blue eyes here. What we're going to do is we're going to check mom and dad's checkbook. Make sure that they make over $51,000 per year. If they do, we're going to give them some blue eyes. That's not what evolution does with respect to phenotypes. So one of the phenotypes, of course, is the capacity of a person to learn. Don't tell me that that's aggregated somehow to the top half of the economic spectrum of our country. It doesn't make any sense. So the United States is underdeveloping half of its population because of what? The tuition bomb, of course. We've got now $1.1 trillion in debt overhang for students. So instead of being a ladder for economic mobility, it's a ladder down into a, an economic hole for a lot of students who are trying to better themselves to contribute, to prepare themselves for contribution in this society. We've got to fix that. We also have the fact that over 90% of the students who are graduating from your institution, if it's on average, are again, above the national median income. There was just an interesting study this weekend that came out that showed that the, the impact on a person's lifespan and their health is highly negative if they start college and don't finish, quite interestingly. It's about two-thirds of the impact of, uh, of smoking. <laughs> really interesting study. So let's look at this circle of innovation, particularly the piece around variation. We'll start with that. What's the importance of this? Well, I'm going to start here with a little anecdote. Now, this you might be able to use in your own personal life, thinking about, OK, what classes might I take if some of you are already in college? Or if you have students in college, uh, children in college, or you have friends that are asking you, what, do you, what courses do you think I should take? What's practical? My daughter called me up a couple of years ago from the University of Oregon. She said, Dad, look, I want to be an artist. You know that. I want to be an artist, Dad. I said, great, sweetheart. Go for it. Be, a, be the best artist. She said, well, Dad, they're, they're making me take this philosophy class, and it has this symbolic logic stuff. And I said to her, I said, well, I said, that's great. Now, I'm really excited about symbolic logic because my background is mathematics and computer science, right? So just to give you a little tee up for the conversation, here's a little sentence it's called in symbolic logic. You probably have all seen this. But just as a little refresher for those of you who might have forgotten. The component P and the component Q, that overall sentence is true if the individual components P and Q are individually true. So for example, Jim is tall, and James Van Arsdale is an excellent MC. That's a true statement, you see? <laughs> But, and that statement, by the way, is considered satisfiable. That is, you can assign truth values to the components, P and Q, such that the overall statement is true. Now, here's one that you can't satisfy. This is tough. For example, this, uh, this podium is brown. And this podium is not brown. No, 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 that's not a true statement, even though one component of it happens to be true, that this podium is brown. All right? So you've got satisfiable statements and non-satisfiable statements. So I'm excited about this stuff because it turns out that you can string together all these components with all these logical connectors. This problem, I won't go into it, turns out to be equivalent to the, the theoretical basis for classroom scheduling. I proved the relationship between these two things. So man, when my daughter said to me, I'm taking philosophy and symbolic logic, I'm excited. So I'm trying to persuade her. I'm talking to all the usual nostrums about liberal education, about expanding your mind about, hey, this has got something to do with, with what your dad does for a living. We can communicate better. And I could kind of hear the yawns on the other side of the phone. <laughs> I wasn't getting any traction, all right? So the conversation turned to boys, and it turned to, to the football, and so on. So I hung up the phone. I was disappointed. I felt like a failure. But then this inspiration hit me. 
She's saying art and symbolic logic have nothing to do with each other. So I thought, hmm, what can I do? And it struck me. And so I ran inside after I parked the car in the garage, and I took two tumblers, as you can see here on, on, the, uh, on the picture, and I filled them up with water, half each. They looked the same. And then I put this little sign underneath, and I said, half full and half empty. See? And if you think about this an unsatisfiable thing I showed you, P and not P, when you, when you try to do a conjunction among opposites, it's usually false. So this is kind of little art in my mind, right? So I'm excited. I sent her this picture. I sent her this picture. And I call her up and say, sweetheart, look, very quickly, I've shown you here that you can combine art and symbolic logic. You have to go for it. And uh, she kind of just sort of paused. And, and I have to say that, uh, that even though I couldn't see her because I was talking to her on the phone, I could see her <laughs> eyes roll back thinking, oh my god, my dad is such a nerd. Right? So she dropped the class. I'm, I'm sorry to say. So look, I felt, <laughs> I felt unhappy. I felt like to some extent I'd failed as a parent because we all want our children to be excited about the values, the ideas that we have. I had failed at this, so I had to think about it further. Uh, a couple of years later, we run the clock forward, and I read this wonderful book. I recommend this to everyone. It's by a Harvard professor named Daniel Gilbert called Stumbling on Happiness. And in this book, he talks about how limited we are in terms of our vision, all right? If I look straight out into this room, I don't see any empty spaces. I see a bunch of tables full of people, but the fact is my mind is playing a little trick on me because 30 degrees this way and 30 degrees that way, I have two blind spots all the time, but I can't see them. I think I see everybody here. I look straight ahead. What my brain is doing, it's fooling me. It's actually painting in those empty spaces with surrounding imagery to make me think I've got the whole picture. So that's a, we don't even have it figured out in the present. Now, the past is even worse, according to Daniel Gilbert. The past, as he says, is a portrait, not a photograph. What we do is we have a couple shards of memory, and off of that, we hang a narrative. Quite interestingly, some of the side facts around this memory is he says that you tend to remember things the way you emotionally anticipated them. So for example, your honeymoon, over the years, the honeymoon kind of gets better and better no matter what actually happened. If in <laughs> fact, you were excited about your honeymoon, right? But when it comes to the future, basically, we suck. We really do. He, we have a disease, what he calls presentism. Or we tend, and it works most of the time, we think that what's going to happen today looks a whole lot like what happened yesterday, so that's the way we go along. But the really important things diverge from that. And so when I thought about that, I realized, hmm, <coughs> the real answer that I should have given my daughter, the real answer is why gamble on an unrelated variation? Why, for example, should college net do scheduling and then do admissions? And then from admissions, go ahead and do uh, faculty and course evaluation. And now today, be so involved with access, mobility, and opportunity. Why should we do these unrelated things? Well, the right answer is you cannot know why. But that could be a very, very good thing. Now let me explain how this might be true. Think about how the Macintosh was first introduced. One of the interesting features of the Macintosh was proportional fonts in the word processor. Stephen Jobs, many years before, perhaps two decades before, had taken a calligraphy, a calligraphy class at Reed College. He really owned it. He loved it. He earned it. He owned it. And that, 20 years later, combined with his work in technology to produce proportional fonts on a personal computer. That was a nice innovation. Here's something that happened in our own existence. Okay? We've had many compliments. Believe me, being able to take classroom scheduling and move it into a SAS environment is a very difficult problem. It's a very difficult computational problem. We have really smart people working on this. We have Maureen Jemison and her group. We have Dr. Hertz Chen and his group working on this problem. And we're finally making success and headway. One of our best, most activist users, I don't know if he's here, Bob Karen from University of Massachusetts, Boston, wrote to us this. Other people wrote to us as well. He said, you've got to be kidding me. Come on. You've taken a quantum leap in online classroom advanced scheduling. I can only hope the architecture and transactional paradigm you have discovered can be applied to other areas of Series 25. Very prescient comment, because that's exactly what we're doing. 
Now, how can we do this? How can we position, be positioned to solve the problem of SaaS-based scheduling? We're the only company in higher education and administrative software able to do this. Well, it's because we took this controversial tangent almost two decades ago into admissions processing. It was very controversial in our company. You didn't get to see all the debates. You didn't get to see the people who had to leave and decided to leave, got upset that resources were being diverted and so on. That's what actually happened, but what happened? A lot of people thought, well, this is a scheduling company. This is our core business. Well, it is definitely part of our core business, but when the internet hit, I wasn't so excited about it for the fact that you could get on the web and tour the White House. I was excited for the idea that this might, in fact, form the infrastructure for connected outsourcing. So I looked for what we could do at that time, which was, in fact, to serve the first web-based admissions application for a college or university. Our first customers were Virginia Tech and Middle Tennessee State University. But from that, in that whole thread, and by the way, we've owned that. We're, we're, we're the best, we believe that. We're the best at processing admissions applications. We have the best infrastructure. It's PCI DSS compliant. It's SOC 2 compliant. We have wizards working on the internet inside CollegeNet. All of that, however, all of that wonderfully redounds to the benefit of our scheduling business because it enables us to take this business in the direction of SaaS. So these two unrelated ideas combined into an important innovation. That's the answer I should have given to my daughter. And by the way, we have talked about this since. And I have the rest of the story for you. So here's the innovation principle that you can use in your own decisions about how to make yourself stronger, how to help your children become stronger intellectually, and so on. It's so long as you can make a variation individually beneficial. Develop it, even if it's not obviously related. Because we cannot predict the future. We're lousy at it. And the world is changing faster and faster and faster and faster. Now, here's the reason why. Here's the kicker. Because you establish a unique position for later combination and innovation. There wasn't any other scheduling company that was doing admissions. I guarantee you there's no other admissions and scheduling company that's talking and developing technologies to solve the problem of access, mobility, and opportunity in this country. <laughs> right now, that's college net. All right, now let's understand the other piece, the most important piece of this circle of innovation, your piece. All right, now, it's interesting, 125 years after the death of Darwin, that there's still controversy about evolution. Interestingly, the formal religions, it's not a controversy. For example, Pope Francis gave a speech to a delegation of scientists in the fall of last year in which he said, creation isn't necessarily a singular moment event. It could play out over the millennia. He understands the beauty of evolution. And it is such a beautiful thing. If you think about it, the sun generates this energy that's very ordered. It has this ordered spectrum of power that's delivered to the Earth. The Earth reflects back these photon photons in a kind of disorder. So natural selection is the planet's digestive system for that order, converting it into life. What an amazing, magical, wonderful thing that we have. What an extraordinary thing that Darwin perceived. And the analog to that, of course, is our own digestive system. We take these orderly things like carrots and broccoli and kale, and we convert them to our, our waste products, undifferentiated energy. But that order gets converted into life. What a wonderful idea. So it's not the, it's not the, the organized religions that don't get this. Now look at this. Let's, let's try to understand how the heck this could happen. Have any of you ever seen this before? Nobody? Pigeons playing ping pong. <laughs> now, I guarantee you, if you take two pigeons and you put a ping pong ball and a little table, you're not going to get much in the way of ping pong match. It's not going to happen. It's kind of like uh, putting a 1,000 monkeys in the room and asking them to, to type Shakespeare. What is going on here? Now, the, I'm going to tell you what is going on and what we're, what we're able to distill out of this circle of innovation and apply to the problem of access, mobility, and opportunity. But that, strangely, the enemies of evolution, even though they speak about love and peace and compassion, are the New Age spiritualists. 
Now, Leonard Mladeno, who is a uh, Caltech physicist, took one for science and said, look, I'll face off with one of the proponents of these new age ideas, a, gu a guy named Deepak Chopra. So you don't even need to read what Mladeno has to say. All you gotta read is what the new age, uh, new age people who are making a lot of money uh, off of, frankly, the gullibility of our citizens. He says, evolution is a club that science has wielded to beat religion into the dust. Okay? Now, uh, Pope Francis didn't get that memo. Uh, that's hardly a compassionate thing to say about such a marvelous idea. He further traces the evolution, he calls it. It's not evolution. It's just a, a changes of state of an, of an iron atom. He says, look, I've got an iron atom in my conscious body. This is a miracle, a miracle because if you take it from the Big Bang, it could have been in so many other galaxies. In our solar system, it could have been in so many other planets. Even on our planet, it could have been in so many other things, but magically, it is in my sentient body. A primal atom has somehow become thoughtful. Now that sounds very poetic. However, it's tantamount to saying we should move things back to pre -science where people believe that rocks rolled down hills because of their inner vis viva, or that wounds healed because of their inner vis medicatrix, or that flies came out of meat because of, of spontaneous regeneration. We don't need to define these words like thoughtful. We don't need to define these words like consciousness. But here, if we're gonna take the lesson of evolution and apply it, we can distill something very powerful. What's the difference? Why are these pigeons playing ping pong? Hmm. What happened was the scientists, including Dr. B.F. Skinner, injected what they called contingencies of reinforcement. It was a selection mechanism. It was a simulation of selection. They put it into this environment, differentially rewarded approximations of the behavior that they wanted, and got the pigeons, got the injected order through selection into this otherwise disorderly mixture of conscious pigeons. Maybe the ping pong ball has thought inside of the iron atoms that exist inside of it. But most importantly, selection was injected into this space. So can we do the same thing? Can we construct mechanisms to improve access, mobility, and outcome in our society? The answer is yes, if we understand the power of this selective mechanism. Here's what we're doing. About three or four years ago, we thought, hmm, you know what, we've got a 1.1, actually at the time it was about a trillion dollars debt overhang. We've got to do our part. We've got to figure out something about how to do this. So we came up with this interesting idea. We let the students create the variations of topics, variations of uh, opinions on those topics, and then we also gave them the selective power to decide who gets the scholarship money. So far we've given away almost two million dollars through this website to help students not only pay tuition, but to pay off student loans. Small piece, but nonetheless a very interesting experiment, an interesting variation. Because what this little engine does, what this little uh, circle of innovation engine does, this variation selection engine does, is it converts advertising dollars into scholarship money, okay? Instead of most folks, uh, like companies do, looking for every way they can to sell your Facebook data, and we said, hey, let's, let's take that advertising money and let's solve this problem. Let's do this experiment and build this selective mechanism. The next thing we're doing, the reason we know that this, this branch that college has taken in admissions is in fact successful. We got the imprimatur of imprimaturs. We got a contract from what's called the coalition. So CollegeNet, you'll be hearing this in the news, CollegeNet was chosen out of many vendors by all of the Ivy League undergraduates, plus about 60 or 70 major institutions to develop a new way of applying to college. And this new way creates a new point of access. It's going to help the universities get to students who are below the national median income because it's going to enable them to, for the first time to look for what really counts in terms of graduating students. And that is engagement. All the retention studies show that the two most critical factors are social and academic engagement. If you could somehow measure that, you could acquire the students that are most likely to graduate. 
The SAT doesn't do a very good job of this. The SAT, the College Board's talking about access and so on, and that's fine. However, the SAT is a predictor for the first half of the freshman year. GPA does a little better. High school GPA predicts for the first year how the student will do. But at the end of the day, it comes down to what the admissions officers are calling grit. Grit is involvement. So if we give students as early as the seventh grade the opportunity to put up their videos, to write in their journal. Uh, by the way, Edison, um, Picasso, Beethoven all kept journals. Uh, I recommend that it's a wonderful thing to do since our human memory is so deficient. We're going to encourage kids to do that, to get engaged. And those students who are engaged are the ones that the universities will be able to select. It's a new way of doing access. Also, what CollegeNet introduced last year is we said, look, what's at the real heart of the problem vis-a-vis -vis higher education? What's at the heart of the problem is U.S. News and World Report. U.S. News and World Report constructs this idea about what a best college happens to be. And I'll give you just one fallacious example. One is that they say that a college is a better college if they have smaller class sizes. Now, somehow, arbitrarily, 19 is their number. But there is no research that supports the fact that at the tertiary level, class size matters in the learning outcome. Because if it really did, there'd be no case whatsoever for online learning. After all, any given online class might have tens of thousands of students. Are you telling me that no learning can happen there? So this is one example of a false indicator of prestige, but yet you have institutions that are actually retrofitting classroom buildings, building new ones of smaller class, uh, classroom spaces, hiring more faculty so that they can raise their profile in US News and World Report, even though the criterion, that criterion is bogus. We had to push back on that. So CollegeNet last fall conjured the social mobility index. We introduced this. I'm very happy to say, to great fanfare, many college and university presidents have praised this. What we're doing is we're measuring something simpler. We're saying, to what extent does the university, your university, enroll students from below the median income at lower tuition and graduate them into good paying jobs? You shouldn't, especially since this is such an important problem, shouldn't this be the criterion for best college in our day and age? And so fortunately, we have lots of engagement. This is the president of Bowling Green State University appreciating the affirmation. It's, this is just another affirmation of BGSU's commitment to our students. And the chancellor at Montana Tech. We call this the ordinary to extraordinary story. Now, we weren't responsible for this, but it is possible. One of the behaviors we want to incite is a reconsideration, or at least a stop, on tuition, tuition growth. It's a great impediment to the US capacity to educate our, our people. And here we see in the state of Washington, our neighbor, that just a month, last month, the governor signed a bill to reduce tuition in the state of Washington. We even got acknowledgment from the Federal Reserve Board. Andrew Gordon notified Janet Yellen of our work. She wrote back, thanks so much for alerting you us to your interesting work. The uh, fourth initiative, this is the most important. This is an opportunity that we can engage in now. I want you to take cl a close look at what Jeff Bolton is doing. We just this weekend received our second patent on asynchronous video interviewing that we're imbuing into the standout system. Now what this is is a chance for you to revolutionize the way in which you match your students to jobs. If you think about it, at most institutions, the career placement office is kind of margin, at the margins, often funded by a few large employers. And so, for example, one of the people I met from, from the Wharton School of Business told me, not at this conference, but a, a girl who had graduated from there, said, you know what, we, we didn't even know that we had any choices other than investment banking because we have this career fair and it's basically owned by Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, and Citicorp. So, so how, do we, how do we know? We can break that. We can break that to give your students the opportunity to look at hundreds or thousands of jobs. And further, to be able to interview with those employers asynchronously. You don't have to schedule. Strange that this is true. But this product is all about getting rid of the need for scheduling. Ironic that a scheduling company would be doing that. 
So I want to leave you with two, two thoughts. One is the end of the story. I'm really proud to report that after these further discussions and ruminations, my daughter decided to take that symbolic logic class last semester. <laughs> and you know what? She made an A. <laughs> so I want to do that same kind of engagement with you. I appreciate the fact that you're here. It's a, a tribute to work with you. And let's work together on standout and any other ways we can think of to combine the variations we're generating to do good in the world. Thanks for listening. <laughs>